All right, so today we begin natural language processing. Again, it is one of the topics that you can choose to do for your end of phase project. Um, today we're gonna do an overview of NLP and I'll say an overview of like basic NLP is all of topic 39. Um, if you do an NLP project that's all topic 39, not including anything from the appendix, that is absolutely okay. Um, so in terms of like what I'm expecting for the project, just know that you don't have to get into the appendix stuff um, if you don't want to for this phase. Um, it is in the appendix for a reason. Um, so today we'll be just talking about some text pre-processing uh, techniques for NLP, because as you know, text data doesn't work well with a lot of the models that we've learned so far. I think I've alluded to some of these methods in the past saying that like every word is going to be a unique feature. So we'll talk about that and some extensions. Um, we'll be talking about, yeah, these are all um, under the category of uh, bag of words feature engineering. Um, a lot of terminology that comes with that. So we'll be going through those processes. And then finally, we'll show just a really quick implementation of a classification model. Um, in this notebook, it is a random forest model. I know I've mentioned that naive Bayes is actually the one that tends to perform better for text data. One, because it is probab probability-based and also it is much faster. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about that. And then we will do a preview of what's coming up tomorrow. Um, so just to get started, uh, let's do an overview of text analytics and NLP. So NLP, which stands for natural language processing, allows computers to interact with text data in a structured and sensible way. Um, again, you know, we can't input words or strings into our machine learning models um, if they are, you know, the value. So therefore we have to find a way to turn these words into some numerical representation. And all of the pre-processing techniques for our words include transforming words or phrases or articles or documents into numerical representations. And this is done in many different ways. Tomorrow we'll actually talk about a bunch of different ways um, other than the ones we'll talk about today. So we'll discuss some steps and approaches to common text data analytics procedures um, to just so, to, so we can see how with NLP, computers can understand human language, meaning, and sentiments. Um, some of the really quick applications of natural language processing. Um, classifying documents is what we, is most accessible to us just because we know our classification algorithms. Um, Chatbots is also one thing. Um, I will say there have been students that have created chatbots or like predictive text or text generation projects. I will talk about some of the um, I guess some of the algorithms that you would use to do something like that tomorrow. And also speech recognition and audio processing. We actually do not get into audio processing in this course, but there are some pre built libraries that you know, can translate an audio. Let's say you have like a, um, an audio transcript. Um, you can turn it into words with certain pre built libraries and then do the same NLP analysis um, once you have it you know, written out in words. So, um, main bulk of today, we'll be talking about some of the uh, most common basic pre-processing steps, feature engineering, and other steps you might need to take to format text data for machine learning tasks. Um, any questions so far to clarify? All right. So this is an overview of pretty much everything we're going to talk about today. Um, this image here will be our raw text. Maybe it's a collection of articles. Maybe it is a collection of, you know, reviews is another very popular one. Let's say you have like restaurant reviews from like Yelp or Google. Um, it goes through a process of tokenization. We're gonna talk about tokenization in a little bit. And you can sort of divide the processing stage into two parts. You have pre-processing of the text um, and feature engineering. And we're gonna talk about both. So pre-processing of the texts, um, it are things like data cleaning, filtering your data, getting rid of noise. And then in feature engineering is actually, you know, taking it one step further because with different feature engineering techniques, you end up with different results. And we'll talk about um, the main one today we're going to talk about is TF IDF. And we'll see that in a little bit. Um, and then after the pre-processing and the feature engineering is done, you can feed it into your model because 
after these two steps, you pretty much have a data frame in the exact same format you were dealing with um, in the last phase project. And then same steps of model evaluation. You wanna do the same thing um, that you did with your last project. If you're doing a classification project, you want to you know, run a bunch of models, tune your hyperparameters um, and evaluate. Um, so those processes, I won't go into much depth because we already did that last phase. Um, the main libraries that we're going to use today that are new is NLTK. NLTK stands for Natural Language Toolkit, if I'm not wrong, um, and it's a Python package built for that. Um, and also we're going to build some word clouds. Um, word clouds, I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts on word clouds in a, um, later when we get there. Um, but you'll see that a lot of these um, libraries that we're going to use are still from scikit-learn. Um, a lot of these methods that I'll talk about later also exist in other libraries. Um, and if you come across them either in the lessons or in your own research, it's fine to use whichever one you're more comfortable with using. A lot of them are interchangeable. Um, so if you see another method that you know does the same thing as what we're talking about today um, from a separate library, you can definitely still use it. So that's something that's important to know, um, that you can use a bunch of different libraries to perform all of these tasks. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out in the, all of the things that we're importing today, and let me just like put them into sections. These are all NLTK things. All of these are our, um, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, all of these are, should look familiar. These are the stuff, all of the same things that we've used um, for our last project. And finally, NLTK I like a lot because it has built in libraries of words that might be useful to you. So for example, and we'll talk about in more detail what these are, um, you have stop words. So for example, you wanted to filter out meaningless words like the, a, and, while, basically words that wouldn't be useful. And we'll talk about that in more detail. You can actually download them from NLTK, which is really, uh, really neat. Um, and also they have specific libraries of different words. Like for example, um, you'd be able to um, have a library of all English words. So let's say you wanted to filter your data set um, to only include words that exist in the English dictionary, NLTK has a library for that. And if you just Google NLTK um, corpuses, I think is the word that you look up, um, you can find a library that suits your task. But most of the time you use like the English one or the stop words one. Questions so far? All right, so as we saw in this diagram here, the first step with NLP is typically tokenization. Um, tomorrow we'll talk about some instances where you might not want to tokenize, but that is gonna be a whole different set of uh, pre-processing methods. But for basic NLP, and honestly for bulk of NLP, um, you wanna tokenize first. So tokenization is basically the process of splitting documents into units of observations. Um, tokens, are also represented as n-grams. And n-grams basically is how many words in a token. So where n, yeah, where n represents the consecutive words occurring in a document. So you have unigrams, which is just single word tokens, which I um, will say is probably the most uh, basic form of tokens. Um, and also there are bigrams, which are two word tokens, trigrams, three word tokens. So for example, we have, this we have this sentence, David works here. And just with this three word sentence, possible tokens would be just David, just works, just here. So each word could be a token. Each word is a unigram token. Um, other possibilities, if you are looking at bigram tokens, you can have David works to be a token, works here to be a token. Technically with this three word sentence, you could also have David works here to be a trigram token. These are like, I think the important thing to get out of this is um, the definition of what a token is, which is just like a unit, which will eventually be your features in your data frame. And also just the idea of n-grams. Um, for these phase four projects, if you just work with unigrams, that is absolutely okay. Um, I will say once you get to n-grams, you imagine because every two word block will become a feature, you end up with way more features. So um, that's something to take into consideration as well. But then with you know two word phrases or three word phrases, you might be able to embed more information. And we'll get into that um, probably not today, but as we're talking about the projects maybe. 
questions. Okay. So as an example, this is, a, I believe, a movie review. And I just saved it as a string. And here, oh, let me just run this just in case. So you'll see when I run all of these installations, they're actually downloading these, um, these packages of words, which is pretty neat. All right, so we have this review over here and we're gonna talk about token, we're just gonna tokenize this. Um, within the tokenized, tokenized library, and we unfortunately, I don't think we have time to talk about regex too much, but regex is a potentially very powerful tool when you want to filter out your data. So the language of regex is just a bunch of convoluted looking symbols all in one. Each symbol has a meaning. Um, to break this up, whenever you're using a regex, similar to you know, how when you do an F string, you always put an F in front of the string and then you can fill it, up, fill it in with variables. Um, if you want your code to recognize something that's regex, and regex is, I'll, in the explanation, I'll get to how you would use regex. But whenever you're using a regex string, you have to put an R in front of the string. Basically what this means is regex is gonna look for any thing in the string that has lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, as well as any numerical values. Um, so this is what that means. And then the plus just means the length of these values don't matter. Um, something to note here, there are no spaces in this regex string. So that's where it's going to split your string uh, by spaces. Um, the difference between this and doing something like a string dot split, and remember dot split is one of our Python built-in methods that takes a string and just gets rid of the spaces. Um, this does it with a little bit more, it's a little bit more nuanced because it really just specifically looks for words with these characters. If you have like an exclamation mark in the middle of a word for some reason, it will not turn that into a token. Um, so basically this will tell you, um, and you can actually like create your own regex terms um, if you want to be more you know strict or loose with how you define what a word is. Um, I posted a tutorial on regex that was actually how I learned regex. Honestly for re regex for me right now is still very much like a trial and error and I'll send out a bunch of resources for like practicing regex as well. Um, I will say you can pretty much get away with doing an NLP project without too much regex, but if you want to get more into the weeds of, I really want to filter out words that have like, I don't know, maybe words that have like five consonants in a row to not be an actual word, um, that's something that you can do. Um, so what's pretty neat is that NLT case tokenized library has a regex tokenizer um, that you just feed it in this regex string and it'll tokenize this text um, for you automatically. So really quickly, you can see that did it really quickly. And then if we take a look at our tokenized review. It has turned each word into its own token, which is pretty neat. And it does it all. Um, you, you can see that it has taken away all of the punctuation as well. Um, so really quickly, um, so this is something I don't think we've talked about explicitly, but this gives you like the frequency distribution. It comes from the, I wanna say the collections library. Oh, from the NLTK uh, probability library. This frequency distribution, something that throws people off is that you actually can't view the frequencies. Um, it, comes out as like an object, but you can actually plot it straight away. So this basically shows in this review, the word counts essentially. So you can see here, you know, the most common word is the at like 15, um, to, he, of, movie, I, a, so on and so forth. Now, looking at these words, are they very informative and can we extract useful information based on this frequency distribution of the most common words? Um, well, based on these words, I think, let's see what else there is. Director trying that what say story has way make and this knows have from beginning gives feeling portray something. I don't think we can extract any useful information from the words that have appeared here. Like the top, what the top 30 words um, there's not really any useful contextual information here. Um, so there's a couple data cleaning steps that we want to take um, with regards to this. 
So first of all, I don't think that's in here, but first of all, notice how there are two versions of and. There's like little small a and and big a and. So one level of cleaning you want to do is make sure everything is in lowercase, just so you know you don't run into these being recognized as two separate tokens. Um, and the second thing you want to do is remove stop words. So again, I mentioned how your stop words. Um, <clears throat> Me. Your stop words is something that is downloaded from NLTK. So all I'm doing is I'm getting a set of all of these stop words. And you can sort of see here, some of the stop words they have here, they have not, my, just. Um, I'm pretty sure and is in here somewhere. The should be in here somewhere as well. Um, but yeah, these are all the stop words. One thing that you can do in your analysis, if based on your context, you think that there are additional stop words, you can actually just append to this list, which is pretty neat. So you can update this stop words list with any stop words that you think uh, don't exist in here, but should exist in here. So really quickly, we're just going to do a really quick filter on this review to get rid of any of the stop words. So all right. Um, what we're doing here, we're just looking to see if a particular word exists in this stop word set or not. And let's take a look at our filtered review. Nice. So we can already see it's one shorter. Um, our original review was this long. Let's actually see how long this one was. 145 words. And then, oh, nice that we have this here. It's gone down from 145 words to 72 words. So essentially, just by doing this step, we've halved the number of columns that we are going to have in our uh, in our data frame. Questions about this so far? Oh, and just to show, these are the new, like, more meaningful words. So movie, which I guess makes sense for this one movie review. Director, trying to say sorry way, yeah. So it's a little bit more useful in the words that have come up. Any questions at this point so far? Just out of a curiosity, why did it keep I in there? Um, I guess, well, because I is not in this list. Oh, and we should have done a lower case, which we did not do. So let's do for w dot, I think it's dot lower, right? There we go. I think if we do this, there we go. We actually, we will cut it down even more to 61 words. And there we go. Yeah, we should, we should have done a lowercase first, which I didn't have in this code. Um, now, even more, um, even more meaningful words. Any other questions? All right, so you, we kind of consider stop words to be like noise in our data in like the NLP space. Um, because they're semantically meaningless. So this one quick filtering step has removed uh, semantically meaningless words. All right, so the next thing that we wanna talk about, another form of noise in text data um, is lexic lexically, is that a word? Just words that kind of mean the same thing. So for example, um, the words collect, collection, collected and collecting are all similar. Um, using things like stemming and lemmatization, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, are, this is a step that reduces all variations of the same word to the root version um, of all its derivation. So this is another process of, you know, one, potentially culling down the number of columns you have, uh, but also, you know, just not having redundancy. You know, when you have things like Literally, like the plural of words is a big thing that throws um, that can increase the number of columns, like collect and collects. Um, you don't need that to be in two separate columns most of the time. And there's two ways to like you know get rid of to do lexicon normalization, um, stemming and lemmatization. Um, so first, stemming, and I will tell you first that lemmatization is the more popular one, but stemming was, I believe, the original lexicon normalization library um, method. So stemming, it allows us to remove different variations of the same word. So again, you know, collect, collection, collecting will all be reduced to the same word collect. Um, stemming reduces the inflection in words to their root forms 
and it maps a group of words to the same stem, even if the stem itself is not a valid word in the language. So the way stemming works, it sort of looks for words that have things like ing, um, ends with an s, ends with like an ed or an er, and just cuts those off. So with this example, if you were to pass any of these through a stemmer, it would shorten the words to change without the E because it sees E as the part that can be changed into um, any of these. So one downside of stemming is you end up with kind of like incomplete words. And that's, I would say, a main reason why people use lemmatization instead. But we'll go through this uh, just so we know. Um, so there are actually different kinds of stemmers. But the most commonly used one is the Porter stemmer. It works very similarly to a, uh, a scikit library where you first have to um, instantiate it. And after we've instantiated, all we're going to do is we're going to take um, our filtered review and just stem every single word. And the stemming works on a word by word basis. So once you run this, you can see that our stemmed review looks like this, you know, uh, begin uh, movie. Um, I will say this one doesn't really take context into um, context into context. Um, so if it sees an E at the end, sometimes it just cuts that off, not knowing, thinking that, for example, I'm guessing that it thinks that movie could be like, I don't know, moving. I'm not too sure what like the code on the back end is and exactly how it recognizes words, but Basically, you do end up with a lot of incomplete words or like half words, where most of the time you can still sort of figure out what it's trying to say. Um, like this is going to be something. Um, instead, stories, dictate, dictator, depending on context, it could change. That's something to keep in mind if you do decide to use a stemmer, but most people don't. Um, and really quickly, if we do a frequency distribution of the review, I think it's still going to be quite similar to um, our um, unstemmed review. But I believe some of them end up being grouped together if we had multiple of the same stem words in our filter review. Uh, but that is just one of the pre-processing steps you would want to do. Um, well, the level up of stemming would be lemmatization. And so lemmatization does a very, very similar process as stemming, but you actually end up with like a root form of it, like a full word um, as its root. So um, yeah, the only difference is that lemmatization re returns real words. So instead of returning M-O-V-I for movie, um, lemmatizer will return the full word movie. So um, lemmatization reduces the inflicted words properly ensuring that the root word belongs to the language. And the root word is called a lemma. So the change that you get here is the lemma of all of these five words. So a lemma is the canonical form, dictionary form, or citation form of a set of words. If anyone's familiar with linguistics, I am not really, but if you're familiar with that, that should, that I, I believe is the linguistics definition of it. So from the same library as the Porter Stemmer, we can get the word net lemmatizer. There are different lemmatizers that are trained on different um, corpuses. And corpus, a corpus is basically a group of documents. But I believe the most popular one is the word net lemmatizer. Um, and that's just something that's been, I honestly forget what it was trained on, but um, it will lemmatize all of your words. So we instantiate it first. And you can see within the lemmatizer that we have instantiated, you can lemmatize any, any word. Just really quickly, let's put this out. Movies, plural, will become, a mo will become movie. Collecting, it sees as its own uh, lemma. Same with collection and collections with an S brings it back to the lemma of collection. So basically what this is saying is that collecting and collection are two different like dictionary entries, pretty much. Um, typically with lemmatizing, you end up with more columns than you do if you stem. So maybe that's something that you want to consider. Um, I'm, assuming, I'm mm -hmm. assuming you don't need to do it on every, like you could, you could like uh, go through, like uh, loop through the whole thing at once. 
Yes. You don't yeah. Like, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Okay. You don't have to do it word by word for sure. Thank you. Um. Yeah. In the cell after this, we'll just do that. Um. Just to compare with some stemming, um, the word movies, which is the same one that we did here, you end up with you know movie without the e, and then collecting. If you stem collecting, it becomes collect. So yeah. Um, see how collecting here was reduced to the same word. So with stemming, you usually end up with fewer unique words overall. And yeah, uh, just as Joey was talking about, we're gonna do the same thing as we did with the stemmer. We're just gonna loop through the filter review um, and see it limitized. And here, the pro over stemming is you end up with real words. And actually, let's see the length of this versus the stemmed one. So the length of this is 61 versus, let's take a look at this. This is, oh, turns out to be 61 as well. Um, but imagine if you had both the words collecting and collection in whatever the text is that you're stemming versus lemming, um, you will end up with more words in your stemmed version versus your lemmatized version. So those are, um, ways to get rid of like the noise. So stop word removal and stemming or limitizing. Any questions at this point? Um, these methods also does the uh, filtering because you check the length? Uh, kind of, yeah. So, um, well, I will say not filtering, um, Stemming and lemmatizing doesn't really filter. It just changes the words. Um, the length, oh, you're right. I should have checked for the length of the unique values. So let's do this really quick. This is what I should be looking for. So stemmed ends up with 47. If we lemmatize it and set, just as a quick recap, set will, um, just take the number of unique values, but yeah, turns out to be the same um, still. Turns out to be 41 unique um, lemmas or stems of the word. Um, but yeah, usually this would end up being lower than the stem version. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> no worries. And in this uh, set form, we have collection and collections as the one board, right? Collection and collections as one word. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? All right. So from here, and I mentioned these are more of um, these are more of pre-processing steps. Um, next, we'll talk about some feature engineering. Um, so feature engineering, how you get from you know this to you know, your actual like data frame. Um, we're gonna talk about it in this section. So first, um, the ML algorithms that we've encountered so far represent features as variables that take on different values for each observation, right? For example, if we have each row being an individual, the values will be like distinct um, education levels, income, maybe some demographics, so on and so forth. Um, this is done differently in NLP. So in order to pass text data to ML algorithms, we have to represent each text observation numerically. And that's the whole uh, thing of NLP, taking your words and representing them as numbers such that it can be fed into a model. Um, one set of methods uh, is a bag of words method. So bag of words or BOW for short, I feel like bag of words is shorter to say than BOW. Um, it's a way of extracting features for, from text for use in modeling. Um, so bag of words is a representation of text that describes the occurrence of words within a document. Um, it involves two things. First, a vocabulary of known words, which we'll, we'll see that will become like, you know, your uh, distinct columns in your data frame. And also a measure of the presence of known words. And this is um, where we'll see two different methods today. So it's called a bag of words because any information about order or structure of words in a document is discarded. Um, the model is only concerned with whether known words occur in the document, but not where in the document. Um, of course, as a um, 
uh, as a caveat to this, um, if you had n grams, you sort of embed that in information a little bit. Uh, we're only going to talk about bag of words with unigrams uh, today, but you can pretty much do the same thing with bigrams, trigrams, so on and so forth. Um, so the intuition between the bag of words methods is that a document is similar to another if they have similar contents. Um, bag of words data can be represented as a document term matrix or a term document matrix in which each column is a unique word and each row is a document. And we'll take a look at some examples. So for example, here we have four documents and here there's three rows, but you can see here we have I love dogs, I love cats, I love all animals. Um, here, basically each column is a unique word that exists across all of your documents. And then this is just a word count. This is one way to represent your bag of words. Um, so you can see that all three documents have the word love. So that's why it's one, one, one. Same with the word I. And then again, based on you know, what words exist in each document, that will be um, how the matrix is filled up. And typically also like all these others would be zeros. Um, we're gonna do this um, right here, right now. Something that's pretty neat is that scikit-learn has a count vectorizer. So count vectorizer is, a, is called count vectorizer because it's really gonna give you word counts for each sentence. Um, and it's called a vectorizer because it's sort of turning your sentences into numerical vectors. So one way um, you can call like, you know, a row of this is a vector. So let's imagine we have these three documents. I love dogs, I love cats, I love all animals. Um, we can fit it to this count vectorizer and you can see it actually works very similarly to like any like scalar within scikit-learn. You first um, will, um, you're gonna first instantiate it. You can also give it a list of stop words and it'll automatically filter the stop words for you. Um, but we're not gonna do that now since we don't have too many words here. And then all you have to do is a fit transform. This, um, I forget what kind of data this comes out in. We'll take a look later, but let's run this code. And this creates the mini data frame for you. If we add a fourth document here, let's just do like, I hate dogs. Um, and we run this, you can see that now the new unique word hate is in this data frame. Um, yeah, let me just take a quick look because I forget what exactly this is. Ah, right. Something else that um, to mention is that um, typically, and you imagine because this is gonna be a pretty sparse matrix, sparse meaning a lot of the values are zeros. It's just a lot more efficient to store the information as a sparse matrix, um, as a sparse matrix data type, which basically any non-zero element, they'll just keep track of, all right, which column, which row is it? And we'll save that value. Um, if this doesn't make any sense to you right now, that's fine, we can talk about it another time. Um, but yeah, all we're doing is turning it into a dense matrix, a regular dense matrix. And we can actually get the feature names or like the unique uh, words to turn them into our column names. And you can see here from the feature names, those are our column names. Questions so far? Yeah, why isn't the word I represented without any stop words? That is a really good question. I I want to say that maybe the count vectorizer automatically has stop words. That's a really good, yeah, I honestly never really noticed that. Um, huh. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to see, I'll take a look at some documentation later. Maybe count vectorizer by itself has some stop words, but yeah, you're right. It, the word I should be in here. Uh, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I'm not too sure. I think, hmm, my, never mind. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make some claims right now, but I have some guesses, but um, yeah, I'll find out. Thanks, Tim. Um, any other questions? Mm, can you explain a bit more about um, each row as a document, for example, in, each tweet, every comment is a document? Ah, so basically it'll be, let's say you want to classify tweets, each tweet will be a it will be a document. So it'll basically a document in this case will be 
an observation in your data set. So it really just depends on like what you're using your data set for. If you want to classify just tweets, um, then yeah, each document will be a tweet. If you want to classify like, I don't know, YouTube comments, each comment will be a document. So each document is an observation. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so usually like every document is of the same form. So you wouldn't have like, um, I don't know, you wouldn't have like a tweet and its comments in the same, actually you could, but then you would just like, I don't know. Yeah, but typically um, the source of the documents is consistent, if that makes sense. As in like, you would have like a data frame of tweets uh, rather than like mixed with, I don't know, Reddit posts and like, uh, YouTube comments. But again, it depends on what you're trying to classify. All right, so you can honestly just take this data and if you have labels on like um, on this information. So let's say let's take this data frame first and then you have like your labels being let's see, which is the one that people hate. You can have your target Y variable being something like oh, let's do it as an array um being like zero 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 one representing zeros being animal lovers one being animal haters and you can throw this into a classification algorithm already in this form in this like count vectorized form this is a uh, method that you can actually throw into any classification algorithm i wonder if i do it right now with like a really small data set that will work so let's try like naive Bayes really quick Let's see, is it multinomial? Here, let me just look for it so you don't see me struggle through remembering all of these. Let me take this. And then we do naive phase dot fit. We can fit our DF and our Y, I believe. And then if we do an MB dot predict, on our data frame, you can see that it predicts perfectly on our four examples. So this is a form of data that you can already fit into your model, no problem. Questions about that? What exactly are you predicting? Um, okay, I just made up, like I made up these labels. Um, basically, this is Zero are people who an, who uh, who are animal lovers, and <laughs> one is animal haters. I just did this based on like these sentences, just as a really quick example. But yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Hope that didn't confuse people. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, in this form, it's good to know that you can already throw that into a um, into a model. You can, if you do like a, I don't know, a random forest model, you can even pull out your most important features, so and so forth. Of course, with this data set being so small, uh, not as useful, but you can scale. All right, um, so this is um, a count vectorizer method of um, pre um, preparing your data for modeling. Um, something that kind of levels up on a count vectorizer is TFIDF vectorizing. So, there are a lot of schemas for determining the values of each entry in a document term matrix. So these values, um, there are multiple ways to represent, you know, words occurring in documents and count vectorizing. I mean, word counts, probably the most intuitive way to do it. One of the other most common schemas is TFIDF and TFIDF basically stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So what it does is it normalizes the raw count of the document term matrix. And it also represents how important a word is in a given uh, in a given document. So the TF part, term frequency, is just you know your count vectorizers, literally this part. But the IDF, the inverse document frequency, um, represents how much information the word provides. Context being, if it's common or rare across documents. So um, this is the the formula, it's a log logarithmically scaled inverse fraction of documents that contain the word, um, which is obtained by dividing the total number of documents by the number of documents containing the term and taking the log of that quotient. That in English terms, basically saying that if you have 
a word that is unique to a specific document, it'll have a higher value because you're just assuming that, you know, unique words in specific documents uh, will add meaning. So in this case, um, let's see, um, I guess in this case, let's ignore this third row first, but every sentence has the word love, right? So in our collection of documents, the word love won't really add information. Whereas these words like dogs, cats, and animals, they are unique to each document. They sort of add information to each document and they don't appear in any other, they don't appear in the other documents. So for document zero, the word dogs is going to have a higher TF-IDF value because dogs is unique to that document. And um, the assumption being if, um, is the assumption is that if a word is unique to the document, it provides more information, provides more value. Questions about that definition. There is a math formula here. You'll never have to do this, but if you were to like break it up, you'll see that, yeah, if a word is unique to a document, it will have a higher TF-IDF value. All right, so just to really quickly implement it, you can see here, I have four reviews. These are all movie reviews. Um, and then I just threw them into a data frame with the column name review. And let's do some vectorizing. So here you can see a couple things are happening. I have my tokenizer here just to clean up this text real quick. Uh, with count vectorizer, I'm forcing all the words to be lowercase, which is something that we forgot to do earlier, but put that back in. Um, We're gonna introduce stop words as well. You can have an n-gram range. So through this count vectorizer, you can actually create your bigrams or trigrams if you want. Of course, here, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna stick with unigrams. And then we're gonna tokenize um, with this tokenizer. So this count vectorizer is going to do all of it for us. So we can see real quick, um, we're doing the fit transform on our review column. And if we take a look at this, remember it's a sparse matrix, but we can coerce a sparse matrix into, oops, sorry. You wanna coerce a sparse matrix into a dense matrix first. Um, and then we can see it as a data frame. So now you can see with these um, reviews, out of the four reviews, we have pretty much 275 unique tokens. Um, right now we still haven't cleaned out the numerical values because you can see here we have some numbers. Honestly, if I take this out right now, oops. Ah, let me just do this real quick. There we go. If I take out the numbers, we end up with 269 unique columns. And then each of these numbers represents like the word count for review zero, review one, review two, and review three. And basically this houses the, um, the lowercase step, the stop words filtering step, as well as the tokenizing step all in one. Um, so with this, let's take a look and see what the TF-IDF vectorizer produces. And same review, um, pretty neat. The TF-IDF vectorizer is also already built in and it works on full strings like this. Oops, wait, hold on. Let's take a look at what this is. Let me just grab the data frame code real quick. Thanks. Yeah. Ah, okay. Never mind. This is, I think, getting it from, oh, here. There we go. So now with the TF-IDF vectorizer, you can see that all of the word, uh, all of the values are gonna be decimals. Um, and the values are slightly, slightly different. So for example, let's take a look at these words. Um, let's see, able and abusive, having one and one here. So able is 0.04 here, abusive is 0.059 down here. So even though they were both ones in the count vectorizer, they have different values in the TF-IDF vectorizer, probably because abusive is a word that is more unique to review three. Any questions about this? All right, and just remember, I had to do this step because um, when you do the fit transform, 
using any like text vectorizer, it turns into a sparse matrix just because in memory it is more efficient to store it that way. All right, so here I have a couple functions that are just going to do like all the count vectorizing for us. Um, so really quickly, we'll take a look and see. This is the count vectorizing review. This is the TFIDF review. Um, this basically does all of the steps at once, basically all the same thing that we did. So we use a TFIDF vectorizer. Um, we did the fit transform, turned it to a dense array. Sometimes you have to transpose it depending on the size of your text. But yeah, we get this result. And pretty much you can take this, throw it into any of your classification models. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is we're just going to run through a really, really quick text classification problem. But any questions at this point? All right. So this data set that we have here is a, why does this always happen? <laughs> Hold on, let me just make sure I have the right, mm, it's not in the folder. There we go. Um, in your repo, it should be in the folder. Um, but yeah, so here we have a satire versus not satire data set. Um, I forget where exactly this one comes from, but basically it already comes with targets. Um, I believe it's zero for satire and one for not, but we'll see. Um, so typically if you have text data, this is what it's gonna start off looking like, right? You can see that in the body of the text, um, it's all raw text. Um, you have, you know, you still have all your stop words in there. You have your capital letters and the cleaning process is part of what you have. But part of what you have to do is the cleaning process. So let's just separate it into your uh, target variable and the rest of your data. Um, from this, you can actually clean out our punctuations. So all of this, what we're doing here, we're getting our stop words. We're adding to this stop word, all of our punctuation and additional things that we've noticed in this data set that could mess up your data. Um, I will say this is a fairly iterative process. Sometimes, you know, before doing this, um, you would get your data frame, notice that there are some weird columns that shouldn't be there. Um, and then you just keep on adding to the stop word list. So we take a look at our stop word list and what it looks like now. You see, I have all of these symbols that I don't want. These are, um, oops, sorry. These are stop words that are, you know, in the stop words library. And we have specific things like satirewire.com, which I'm guessing is one of the data sources of, uh, of this data set. So um, I know last project, I um, emphasized writing functions a lot. Um, for NLP, writing functions is going to help you a huge bunch. Um, so here we have a function that just removes stop words. So you can see I'm tokenizing an article. And here, all I'm doing is filtering it out uh, using a list comprehension. And so with this function, and this actually takes a while to run because it's running it on a good, uh, I should have shown how many um, we have. So really quickly, let's take a look at what this data frame looks like. It's a thousand points. And if we do df.target.value counts, it is a perfectly balanced data set. All right. So after this pre-processing step, let's actually take a look and see what our process data looks like. Let's just take a look at the first one. It's done all of the tokenizing for us, which is sweet. So let's just take a look at all of the unique words and how many unique words we have in this data set, um, 26,000. So basically without further cleaning, uh, we would have 26,000 columns in our data frame which is why I mentioned things like PCA would be very helpful with NLP um, or you know more culling of your columns. So here we're just gonna lemmatize it real quick and lemmatizing, let's take a look at our lemmatized output real quick. All right, so you can see that our clean data looks like this, which is a lot nicer than, uh, well, a lot, more appropriate for putting into models than what we had before. Uh, we don't have any more uh, punctuation. Um, I, I do see a, stop, um, a full stop there, but I don't know why that is still there. But anyways, given that, 
let's just do our usual chain test split and we're going to do a TFID vectorization. So TFID vectorizer, one thing to remember that to prevent data leakage, when you're vectorizing your data, you only want to vectorize it on your chain set. Um, with a count vectorizer, that doesn't matter. And why is that the case? Just remember that count vectorizer is just a word count, right? It's not going to take data from other documents. Whereas TFIDF, um, it has inverse document frequency. So it actually matters, as we saw earlier, you know, whether the word appears in other documents or not. Um, you want to do that on your chain set because there's potential data leakage there. So as you can see here, when I'm using my TFIDF vectorizer, I'm doing a fit transform on my train and my transform on the test. And basically this is named just because it's the lemmatized version. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I think we should be able to, yeah. So our matrix is 800 by 19,000. Oh wait, yeah. Um, first you can see like how many non-zero elements there are per article um, and the number of columns with zero, the percentage of columns that is zero is 99. So it's a very, very sparse matrix. So that's something to remember that in um, NLP data, because not every document is going to have every word, uh, you're gonna have a very, very sparse matrix. And that sometimes can affect, um, can affect the runtime of your models because you have all of these columns that they're still gonna take into account. Um, as part of an EDA for an NLP project, I'll just go through it really quickly. It's mostly about word counts and what kind of like words appear more in whichever category. Comparative EDA is very, very important. Um, especially if it's classifying for NLP. So running all of this, this is basically showing us um, the number of unique words that are in satire posts and non-satire posts. And so we can he see here, satire is one, non-satire is zero. So an example of a satire post, um, you have these, um, these words. All right. Just as more NLP, I see the most common, more EDA, sorry, more EDA. You have people being the most common word, things like EU, I guess this has Brexit in here. And for non-satire, you have, I guess it seems that it's more America-centric, um, but yeah. Um, this is just more word frequencies, same thing. And then, we can also visualize these as bar charts. So you can see in our satire versus non-satire words, sorry, let me just make this a little bit more viewable. Oh, this doesn't zoom in, but you can see that the words are actually different. If you're doing a, a classification project, I think having like, you know, uh, words that appear way more in satire versus non-satire would also make a very good EDA chart. Finally, just so that you have the code here, word clouds. Now I mentioned I have some thoughts about word clouds. Uh, for presentations, word clouds are great because non-technical, the size of the words, let me just print this really quickly. The size of the words just represents how often a word appears. So including word clouds as part of your presentation EDA, usually pretty helpful because you don't really have to explain too much. I will say for your notebook, of course, you're going to have your word cloud there because it's used for your presentation, but having a word cloud is not generally enough um, as NLP EDA. So just really quickly, this is our satire words. You see like people, EU, non-satire words, Trump, US, government, president, so on and so forth. And I'm just going to run through this really, really quickly. Um, we're fitting a random forest classifier here. Um, with 100 estimators apparently. Um, and then we're doing our fit on our train data, uh, predict on our test data, and we can score it. So you can see here, we have an accuracy of 0.97, F1 of 0.96 is actually pretty good. Uh, we have our usual confusion ma matrix, all of these steps exactly the same as what you were doing um, before. Um, one thing that's pretty cool, you can also see your plot important features. Um, so Again, depending on which model you use, um, naive base doesn't have important features, 
but from this random forest model, you can get that information. So just really quickly, we can get our feature importances. And all you would do is you would zip them with your column names and you'll basically find out what are the most important words for classifying your data. All right, so I feel like we're pretty good on time. We're just about to end. Um, we've gone through some of the modeling processes. Sorry, I felt like I was speeding through at the end because I wanted to finish on time. But yeah, any questions before I talk about what's coming up tomorrow? Cool. So today, all we talked about was, you know, how do you turn text data into numerical representations? Um, and then we also have this really quick example of throwing it to a model. Of course, if you decide to do an NLP uh, classification project, you're, you'll be going through a lot of the similar uh, EDA and modeling processes that you did for phase three projects. So keep that in mind. Um, I probably will see, at, I will ask for at least three or four models uh, to be tested. Um, what to look forward to tomorrow. Um, oh wait, conclusions of today, representing our language in a way that computers can understand to model. Uh, we can use any of the ML algorithms that we've already learned to classify text documents. We can include PCA to lower the dimensionality if you'd like as an intermediate step. Um, there are still some disadvantages and we talked about these disadvantages under bag of words, right? We're taking away structure of our language. We're not really considering where in the text a certain word belongs. And we'll get to that tomorrow. Uh, and that will be talked about in the um, context of word embeddings. Word embeddings is basically another representation of your text that embeds meaning, which is pretty cool. And also topic modeling is another thing I'll show really quick. Topic modeling is basically like clustering, but more specifically uh, for words. And we'll go through some examples tomorrow. All right, any questions before we close out? Cool. All right, we continue NLP tomorrow. Um, any questions on this stuff, do let me know. Um, if you already have an idea of what topic you wanna work on, um, let me know because I could potentially start pairing you all up if you wanna get a head start on the project. So if that sounds of interest to you, let me know. All right, then I will talk to you all tomorrow for more NLP. Um, as usual, any questions along the way, just let me know. Okay, well, have a good rest of your day, everybody. Bye. Thank you.